The Vape Passion Show, episode 56. In this episode, we're going to talk about the Cole Bishop Amendment reintroduced for the new Congress session, Heartland, Wisconsin's government will protect the vape industry in their jurisdiction, Vermont Vapor fined $50,000 for smoking cessation claims, a preview of the Aspire Nautilus 2, should smokers be allowed to smoke if they want to, and how to pair e-juice with your morning cup of coffee. Hey, welcome back to the Vape Passion Show. Like I mentioned last week, I was going to be in Pennsylvania visiting one of my clients for work. I was in downtown Philadelphia for the evening and I wanted to visit a few vape shops, but I ended up only having time to visit one shop. Um, that was Vaporadelphia. It's a really small vape shop, but they had a nice selection and a very friendly staff. I was actually pretty surprised by how friendly they were. So that's a really cool shop I'd recommend visiting if you're ever in Philadelphia. I only picked up two small bottles of e-juice because I was traveling with carry-on luggage only because I was only in there for a night, so, well, two days. Uh, I didn't want to bring a, a check-in bag or anything like that. So that meant I had to limit how many e-juices or how many liquids I could carry with me at a time. Um, you know, if you're if it's a carry-on bag, you can only bring on one quart-sized bag, which is pretty small. So both flavors that I picked up were from Cutwood. Uh, that was Mega Melons and Boss Reserve. Both flavors I'd had before and I liked. So I saw those on sale for only $6 each, so I, I couldn't pass that up. I, I ended up buying those. And while we're on the subject of flying, uh, this was the first time I've ever flown with vape gear. Um, it was super easy. Nobody even asked any questions. I brought my K-Box 200, uh, the Mutation XV3 RDA, some extra cotton, a bottle of e-juice, and two 18650 batteries in a case. I was a little worried about bringing those batteries in because the TSA website says that lithium ion batteries aren't allowed on the plane, which is what 18650s are. Uh, but then it states that e-cigarette spare batteries are allowed as long as they are in a case. So contradictory rules, but I had no problems uh, going there or coming back, going to Pennsylvania or coming back. So I think as long as the batteries are in a case, you're good. If you don't have a case though, they'll probably make you throw them out. So just know that before you go flying. That trip was exhausting though. Um, I flew in on Monday morning uh, with one of my coworkers. So we got to the airport at about 5 p.m., grabbed a rental car immediately, picked up another coworker who flew in earlier. And then while they visited one of their clients, because we had to visit two clients in there on a different team than I am, I walked around downtown Philly while they were visiting their client uh, just for a couple of hours. And after their meeting, we immediately drove to Drums, Pennsylvania, uh, which took two hours from Philly, uh, maybe two and a half hours, somewhere around there. And then we went right to sleep. So then we had to get up early in the morning. Well, not too early, but about eight. All of us were meeting the second client who we met for about four hours and then immediately drove right back to Philadelphia, another two and a half hour drive, uh, caught the plane to Denver, um, and then came home and went to bed. So I didn't really have much free time at all, just that those couple of hours uh, on Monday evening, but it was so cold that night. If I do this trip again in the future, I think I'll, I'll probably try to get an extra day tacked on just so that I can do a little sightseeing in Philadelphia. All of us, we really wanted to see those uh, the Rocky steps from the Rocky movie, but yeah, we didn't have time to do anything really. So yeah, that was my trip to Philadelphia. All right, and so I have a question for you guys. I vaped the last of my Pearberry Melon from a company called Southern Vapory, and uh, they went out of business a long time ago, actually. So I've held on to this bottle for a long time and I haven't been wanting to finish it because I like it so much and if you look at the bottle it says mixed on April 10th 2015 so yeah it's pretty old but it's still very good even this old almost two years old and it's still really good and this was one of my absolute favorite e-juices so my question is if any of you guys know who Southern Vapory was who ran it or if they changed their name or if they released any of their recipes please let me know because I really want to get some more of this e-juice if I can all right and I also just recorded my reviews for some e-juice that high class vape company sent over uh, they're the High Class Vape Company is a pretty good budget line, but they also have a premium line, which is what I just reviewed. The flavors are actually really good. They're unique and more intricate than their budget line, which I wasn't expecting, but they are. And uh, they're pretty sweet too, which is what I like. I'm not sure when those reviews are going to go up on YouTube, but they are recorded, so I just need to edit them and then uh, get them up. Might be a week or so. And let's see if I got anything else in here. So I got these, uh, these large 8-ounce storage bottles from Harbor Freight. So these are bottles that are always recommended by people like um, Fresh03. He recommends these bottles for storing, I don't know about storing e-juice, I can't remember, but I bought them to store vegetable glycerin and propylene glycol for DIY mixing. Um, I'm, not, I'm probably not going to use the third one. Uh, I'm not going to store nicotine in there. I'm, I'm going to keep my nicotine in a glass bottle. But these will be perfect for VG and PG because um, both of my, my 
those bottles, the VG and PG, they're, they're very hard to pour out of the bottles that come in. So these bottles will make it really easy to mix. So I'm really excited to get those. And you can get a three pack for, um, I think it was $3, so really cheap. All right, anyway, let's get into the topics this week. So the Cole Bishop Amendment is reintroduced for a new Congress session. This is some really big news for the vaping industry. Uh, representatives Tom Cole of Oklahoma and Sanford Bishop of Georgia have reintroduced uh, a new bill designed to save the vaping industry. Uh, Tom Cole, he's a Republican, and Sanford Bishop is a Democrat, meaning this is a bipartisan bill, uh, making it more likely to be co-sponsored by both parties. This new legislation is being called the FDA Deeming Authority Clarification Act of 2017, or H.R. 1136, which is very similar to H.R. 2058, more commonly known as the Cole Bishop Amendment, uh, which they originally introduced in early 2015. So the FDA's deeming regulations requires that any product released after February 2007 to go through a lengthy and, and costly review process. There weren't any vaping products on the market at that time, so this rule applies to pretty much every va vapor product ever made. So February 2007 is the FDA's predicate date. H.R. 2058 was designed to amend the FDA's pre-market review requirements for tobacco products by moving that predicate date to August 8, 2016 which was, was the date that the deeming regulations took effect. H.R. 2058 was an amendment added to the 2017 Agriculture Appropriations Bill, but after Donald Trump was elected, Congress passed a continuing resolution that delayed the budget process, which put the Appropriations Bill on hold, effectively putting H.R. 2058 on hold. That bill needed to be passed during the current Congress session, and that Congress had their final meeting on January 3rd of this year. Since it wasn't passed before that time, the, the bill, the proposed bill, was wiped from the books, hence the reason for this new uh, reintroduction of this bill. So this new bill has the same main focus of H.R. 2058 of moving that predicate date to August 8th, 2016, but H.R. 1136 includes some slightly different language. Uh, it's designed to gain a little bit more support from Democrats, hopefully, uh, mainly pertaining to advertising restrictions. And anyone familiar with H.R. 2058 uh, will know that not the whole amendment isn't all positive you know there are some things that kind of suck about it because it does require that the fda regulate batteries it will introduce new labeling rules and standards and it will also require that all retailers and manufacturers register with the fda so while this bill isn't perfect H.R. 1136 is the first step in saving the vaping industry in the United States. Currently, the FDA's regulations require that all vape products go through the PMTA process, which most people believe will not result in even a single vaping product to be approved, which would basically wipe out the vape industry by 2018. And that's the FDA's cutoff date for approving any product currently being sold. That's uh, August 2018. The one exception would probably be products made by Big Tobacco, because these are the only businesses who could actually afford to go through this PMTA process. H.R. 2058 had a total of 77 co-sponsors by the end. Um, hopefully all of those co-sponsors immediately jump back in on this one in support of this new bill, and hopefully we can get this one passed right away. So what can you do right now? Well, you can show your support by emailing and thanking both Tom Cole and Sanford Bishop. You can also start contacting your local legislators uh, and asking them to support HR 1136. Um, and I would also keep an eye out on CASA.org. I'm hoping they put a call to action up on this one soon. All right, moving on. So the Heartland, Wisconsin government plans to protect the vape industry in their jurisdiction. In what I believe is probably the first time this has ever happened in the vape industry, a local government is actually actively trying to protect the vape industry within their jurisdiction. The village of Heartland, it's a suburb of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. It's home to Johnson Creek Enterprises, who is currently in danger of being shut down due to the FDA regulations that were passed last year. One of the requirements of the FDA's deeming regulations is that all tobacco products must be submitted to the FDA with a pre-market tobacco application. Uh, that's a PMTA. Since the deeming regulations classify vape products as tobacco, this means that all vape products need to go through the PMTA process, including each individual mod, atomizer, and e-juice. Now, e-juices here is the problem for Johnson Creek. They are an e-juice manufacturer. So with e-juices, every variation is considered a different product. Let's take a bottle of Guilty Pleasure from High Class Vape Company, for example. Guilty Pleasure comes in 15 milliliter and 60 milliliter bottles. That is two different products right there. And each nicotine strength is also a different variation or another product. So if each bottle size comes in 0, 3, 6, and 12 milligrams of nicotine, that's four different products in each size of bottle. So you can see how that gets out of control really fast. Johnson Creek makes more than 200 different e-liquids, many of which are rebranded for other e-juice companies. Something else we know is that each PMTA is estimated to cost about a million dollars to go through the whole process of, of t testing and doing all of the studies. So for Johnson Creek, that would come out to around at least $200 million just to 
keep all of the products on the shelves. So that would definitely put them out of business and would result in all 50 of their employees' jobs to be lost and all the money that they're bringing into their local economy. So in a hearing with the village board, Johnson Creek asked for support to keep their business open and the board actually voted to help. And this appears to be a very realistic possibility. According to Linda Hansen of the Electronic Vaping Coalition of America, there are federal laws that allow local governments to interfere with federal laws when those laws negatively impact businesses within that local government. This is such a, a smart way of protecting the vape industry. I hope more local governments follow suit. Okay, now onto some bad news. So Vermont Vapor is fined $50,000 for making claims of smoking cessation. Vermont Vapor is a vape shop in Castleton, Vermont, and they face a fine of $50,000 from the Vermont Office of the Attorney General for violating state marketing regulations that are related to making claims that e-cigarettes can be used to quit smoking. Smoking cessation claims are not allowed anywhere in the U.S., since electronic cigarettes are not approved by the FDA as a cessation product. The issue here, though, is that Vermont Vapor never actually made claims that e-cigarettes can be used to quit smoking. Vermont Vapor, they placed uh, TV clips and customer reviews and testimonials on their website, their YouTube channel, and social media channels that came from their customers, uh, which did make claims that vaping had helped them quit smoking. But Vermont Vapor never made these claims themselves, uh, fully understanding that they weren't allowed to. They even state on their FAQ page that e-cigarettes are not a cessation device. More specifically, the actual wording is, the electronic cigarette is an alternative to smoking and is not a smoking cessation device. Some people have quit smoking using the electronic cigarette, but we make no such claims as to the effectiveness for that purpose, and e-cigs are not sold for that purpose. But this didn't stop the uh, Virginia Attorney General from enforcing a penalty. The Attorney General is demanding that Adam Treadwell, the owner of Vermont Vapor, provide proof of the claims that their customers have made besides quitting smoking. So how ridiculous is that? Uh, what other proof is there? That right there is proof. The Attorney General is also requiring that Vermont Vapors link to the Vermont Department of Health cessation services website from their own website and Facebook page. And that's a really strange demand. And also interestingly, uh, the Assistant Attorney General, Tony Hamburg Clithero, uh, started a competing vape business called Vermont Vapors with an S. Uh, she received a cease and desist from Treadwell's attorney for violating his trademark, after which she requested $1,000 from Treadwell to cover the cost of rebranding her company. Treadwell then threatened to sue, and then he never heard back. And some people believe that this fine may be in retaliation from the issues with the assistant attorney general, but that hasn't been proven. But it sure is strange. And as far as anyone is aware, this is the first time that a vape business has been fined for claims made in customer reviews. Adam Treadwell said that he has no intention of signing the enforcement agreement or paying the fine, and that he's decided to close his business, exit the vaping industry entirely, and then move out of Vermont. All right, now let's talk about a new product. So this is a preview of the Aspire Not Nautilus 2. I don't own one and I haven't tried one. So this is just my thoughts about the Nautilus 2 after hearing and reading about it. You might already know that the original Aspire Nautilus and Nautilus Mini are considered one of the best and most popular mouth to lung uh, tanks ever. Uh, the Nautilus performed great, looked great, and was affordable. And it's still recommended by many people as the perfect tank for a new vapor to start with. It's actually the first tank that I purchased when I started vaping again in 2015. I bought it because so many people were telling me how great of a tank it was. I ended up giving it to my brother for his first setup, but I missed it so much that I actually went out and bought another one. So in my opinion, it's that good. Then Aspire released the Nautilus X, which was supposed to be the successor to the original Nautilus. I've never owned one, but most people agreed that it didn't compare. Uh, some people liked it and some people hated it, but it didn't do nearly as well as the original model. And now Aspire has released the Nautilus 2, which looks to be the true successor to the original Nautilus. Now, if you look at it, this tank has had a serious update as far as looks go. Uh, it looks really sleek, in my opinion. And what's also really interesting is that Aspire made this tank work with the original 1.8 ohm Nautilus coils, which means you can use these coils in both tanks. They've also released 0.7 sub ohm coils, which would also work in the original Nautilus. Now, I'm a, a little bit concerned uh, that they release sub ohm coils for this because sub ohm coils they usually require higher wattage and a lot more airflow. When manufacturers try to make tanks suitable for both mouth to lung vaping and straight to lung vaping, the mouth to lung experience usually fails entirely. But from what I've read, the sub ohm coils uh, perform best around 20 watts, uh, which still sounds like a good range for mouth to lung vaping. So it comes in four colors stainless steel. And then the other three colors come in anodized aluminum, uh, black, red, and gray. It has a bottom airflow control ring and has a short chimney designed for better flavor. This is also a top fill tank, which requires that you unscrew the outer casing to expose the glass tank. I really like the outer shell too. It seems like that it would help to protect the glass if you accidentally drop the tank. So I think this looks really cool. I really want one. And at the very least, I wanna grab some of those uh, 0.7 ohm coils and try it out in my original Nautilus. All right, let's move on. So should smokers be allowed to smoke if they want to? Normally, the vape community is, is 
very anti-smoking and for good reason. Uh, we all know the dangers of smoking and, and that's why most of us vape uh, as a way to reduce the amount of harm that we're doing to our bodies. So this story is going to be a little bit different. In Jakarta, Indonesia, Adisha Pernomo is the head of, of an organization or a group called Komunitas Kritak. It's an Indonesian smokers' right, rights group. His organization aims to protect the rights of Indonesia's people to smoke if they want to. His group also argues that tobacco regulation will damage the advertising industry and will affect the scholarships that tobacco companies are allowed to offer. Some of Pernomo's claims are a little controversial, though. Well, not a little. They are quite a bit controversial. Uh, the most popular cigarette in Indonesia is the Kretek. It's a clove cigarette. Pernomo claims that the Kretek can treat asthma, cure bad breath, and they're not addictive. These cigarettes are also often sold out of stalls right outside of schools. Indonesia is actually one of the only Asian countries left uh, that has not yet banned tobacco advertising, which can be pr found pretty much everywhere. Um, so Pernomo's group is also a trade promotion organization for his local cigarette industry. So they're definitely biased. But I have to agree with his stance on giving adults the right to make their own choices. As far as regulations go though, I, I think there probably should be more strict re regulations in place as long as they're reasonable. Um, but I think if people want to smoke, um, no matter what country they're in, as long as they are of legal age to smoke and they aren't harming anyone else, they should be allowed to smoke. And the reason I bring this up is because I think the same of vaping. I, we see a lot of politicians and health organizations trying to regulate vaping out of existence. But if people want to vape, that's their personal choice and it should be allowed. If people want to drink Mountain Dew all day, if they want to drink alcohol or smoke weed or eat a McDonald's for every meal, that's their choice and it should be respected. I realize that this subject is a lot more complicated than I've ma just made it out to be. For example, um, while obesity mostly affects the the person who is overweight, it also increases the cost of health care, um, health insurance for everyone paying into private and public health insurance, even people who are healthy and never have to go to the doctor. So yeah, I get it. But if you disagree with me on this, that people should be allowed to smoke if they want to, or if you feel like that maybe I'm not getting the full picture and I've missed something, please let me know. Um, send me an email at alex at vapepassion.com or leave a comment on my YouTube video because I really love philosophical discussions and I'm always willing to change my views when I'm presented with, uh, with, with good arguments. All right, and now let's talk about how to pair e-juices with your morning cup of coffee. So I've talked about how to pair e-juices with wines before. Now let's talk about pairing e-juices with coffee. Uh, many of us enjoy a vape with our morning coffee. The two just go perfect together. So I decided to do a little bit of research and put this together to help you guys get the most out of your morning cup of coffee. So one of the first places to look is what coffee companies are already doing to flavor their coffees. Large coffee companies obviously know the industry best. They've had decades to figure out what flavor combinations that consumers like the best. And they probably have expert chefs and research and development teams working on uh, different flavor pairings on a regular basis. Some of the most common popular coffee flavors include chocolates, and that includes things like fudge, dark chocolate, and cocoa, cinnamon, vanilla, caramel, mint, peppermint, toffee, hazelnut, and uh, all of these often have combinations of nuts. Uh, that could be almond, macadamia nut, or pecans. And then there are some that aren't as common, but they are around, and that would be things like blueberry, raspberry, peanut butter cup, eggnog, graham cracker, and gingerbread. And now let's talk about creamers, because obviously, you know, people add these creamers to their coffees. They must make good pairings. These are perfect examples of e-juice flavors that you can pair with your morning cup of coffee. Um, milk and cream, obviously, so anything creamy. Uh, Irish cream, pumpkin spice, nutmeg, French vanilla, vanilla caramel, chocolate caramel, caramel macchiato, and cinnamon vanilla. And then some more interesting flavors that I've seen were uh, snickerdoodle, chocolate chip cookie, eggnog, caramel apple, chocolate raspberry, and cinnamon bun. And now let's talk liquors. So there are some people who do like to mix alcoholic beverages in with their coffee, not usually in the mornings, but vaping liquor flavored e-juice with coffee is a great way to start the morning without heading into work with a buzz. So um, some of the most popular are probably Amaretto and Kahlua, but people do also like to mix in just straight alcohol, uh, straight liquor like rum, bourbon, scotch, whiskey, tequila, and brandy. I'm, I'm not sure if I've ever seen a tequila flavored e-juice, but I don't know, there might be one out there. I have seen other liquor flavored e-juices, but I haven't tried any other than Castle Long from Five Ponds, which is like a Kentucky bourbon flavor. Uh, it's expensive, but it's a good and complex flavor if you like straight bourbon. And now dessert e-juices. So this is just common sense, right? People love to pair baked goods like cookies, cakes, and pastries with their coffees. So let's take a look at some of the popular options. You have chocolate cake, custard or lemon custard, apple pie, uh, raspberry macarons, blueberry scones, tiramisu, cheesecake, chocolate strawberries, glazed donuts, pancakes, bread pudding, brownies, banana bread, chocolate, crumb cake, cookies, and ice cream. And I've seen all of these mentioned a lot of times on, uh, on how to pair desserts with coffees. So these are very good 
examples, I think, of, of e-juices that you could pair with your coffee. And really, it kind of looks like any dessert flavored e-juice would pair well with coffee. Um, and in reality, any dessert flavor probably would. But it looks like the best options are bakery and pastry flavors. The one exception would be ice cream. I've also heard that a small percentage of people uh, actually like the flavors of Sambuca or anise with their coffee. So if you like to vape black licorice e-juice, that would probably also be a good choice to, to pair with your coffee. And now the tried and true tobacco and coffee. So like most smokers and former smokers, you probably remember the joy of having a smoke with your morning cup, cup of coffee. So it makes sense that you'd want to pair your coffee with a tobacco flavored e-juice. And there are some great tobacco flavored e-juices on the market, many of which are more unique and intricate than you'd expect. Uh, RY4s, for example, they're my personal favorite. They're combinations of typically tobacco, vanilla, and caramel. They don't really taste a, a whole lot like tobacco, but they do have slight hints. Some of them do. There are also many variations of pipe tobacco flavored e-juices. Um, pipe tobaccos are very aromatic and much more complex than cigarette tobaccos. And you can find tobacco flavored e-juices uh, with notes of cherry, vanilla, and peach. And something that seems to be growing in popularity are NET, or N-E-T, tobacco e-juices. That stands for naturally extracted tobacco. Uh, naturally dash extracted dash tobacco.com is a one popular e-juice manufacturer for NET e-juices. And another company that I've heard a lot about recently is called Black Note. I haven't tried them, but I've heard good things. Uh, they do tobaccos of all kinds. All right, so now we've already talked about a whole bunch of different flavors that pair well with coffee. But if you're a real coffee aficionado, you should consider pairing your flavors based on the body, boldness, and the roast of your coffee. So body refers to the heaviness or the mouthfeel of your coffee. The body is usually determined by the brewing method. For example, espresso machines and French presses will typically have a fuller body. And any brewing method that uses a paper filter, such as the everyday coffee machine, that will filter all the oils out of the coffee and re will result in a lighter body. Fuller body coffees usually pair better with rich or creamy flavors like dark chocolates, cheesecakes, and pecan pie. Uh, lighter bodied coffees would pair well with fruit, cookies, and meringue pie. Now let's talk about roasts. So this is a lot like you'd expect. Dark roasts, they usually complement rich and creamy flavors, while light roasts complement lighter flavors like fruits and cookies. Medium roasts tend to pair well with things like chocolates, nuts, and earthy flavors. And finally, also consider the notes of the coffee that you're drinking. For example, if your coffee has hints of cherry, we know that cherries go well with cheesecake and tiramisu. So these would be great e-juices to pair with your morning coffee, if your coffee has cherry hints. Okay, so if you're a coffee drinker, which you should be because coffee and caffeine are amazing, but these tips should help you find some great e-juice flavors to pair with your cup of coffee in the morning. I actually used to be a bit of a coffee snob, um, sort of, not entirely. I wouldn't mind a crappy cup of coffee occasionally, but a few years ago, I really got into the into coffee making as a, a sort of a hobby. So I went out and bought a burr grinder so that I, I could make sure that the coffee grounds were ground very well, uh, not like a, a blade grinder. Uh, I would only drink organic and freshly roasted coffee, and I own a bunch of different coffee makers, uh, like a French press, a mocha pot, a couple of pour-over coffee makers, an Aero press, a Turkish coffee pot, and probably some other things that I'm, I can't think of right now. And I still prefer high-quality coffee over coffee machine coffee any day, but I'm not very picky these days. Um, hell, I'll drink the, the cold leftover coffee that my wife leaves in the machine when I get home from work. All right, so that's going to do it for this episode. You'll find the show notes for this episode on vapepassion.com. Just do a search for episode 56. If you want to support the show, consider donating to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash vapepassion. You can follow me on Twitter at vapepassion, and I'm also on Facebook if you want to leave me a comment. If you like this weekly show, please consider giving me a thumbs up on the video and subscribe to my channel if you're not already a subscriber. You can also subscribe to the podcast version of the show on either iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play. If you'd like to get notifications of new reviews or of the show, you can sign up to receive my weekly email on vapepassion.com. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email me anytime at alex at vapepassion.com. All right, I'll see you next week.